Hey everyone, we're glad you're here today. Welcome back to our Cyber Threat Workshops with Risk IQ. Uh, Josh Mayfield here along with Benjamin Powell. Today we're gonna get into a little bit of some threat hunting at scale and spoiler alert, we're gonna go into some, some berry areas. Um, the uh, cozy bear, fancy bear, something bear, they're always bears. You know, APT29, very uh, infamous and notorious threat actor group. Uh, today, we're going to show you a little bit about some of the latest infrastructure research we've done to identify where they are, where they're hiding, how they're behaving and acting. Um, but while we're uh, waiting for everyone to pile into the virtual room here, we'll just give it a couple of minutes before getting into all that fun, as well as getting into Benjamin. I know every single time we do these, there's one consistent piece of technology that keeps coming up all summer long, which is Jupyter Notebook. And so we're going to get into some Jupyter Notebook fun today as well. Um, and looking at this research and how the investigation is performed with our researchers uh, that are here with us today. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to show how to scale that, how to automate a lot of it uh, when it comes to identifying and finding these uh, exotic threats. So um, any, any opening words that you have for, uh, for the folks as everybody's coming into the, the virtual room here? It's, it's always amazing when I talk with um, Team Atlas, all the, the stuff that they do and how they figure out and they piece things together. It's just amazing. And then from, from what they had talked to me about, I worked with other team members, Mark Hendrick and others, to um, create the Jupyter Notebook to be able to, to do that same sort of thing at scale. It's just incredible. It's, it's like um, every day is a learning experience, and I hope that um, the audience today really can take what um, we have in the Jupyter Notebook, for example, and then scale it to do other things to, that will make the internet a safer place. That's what we're trying to do. That's yeah, and you're, cool. and you're totally right. One of the things that's interesting is that, um, and again, there's going to be a poll question here in a little bit, folks, just to understand the experience in the room, uh, what your goals are, just to make sure that we tune things to those specific situations. Um, but what's always interesting when we're in these conversations uh, is that we're going to show you ways that you can do this yourself. So we're going to show you some pretty sophisticated research and some, uh, some skills that um, Kevin with our uh, Team Atlas uh, uh, group is going to be showing some of this stuff with ABT29. But this is uh, safe to use at home, so to speak. Like you can go and do this yourself. Uh, very DIY. And we're going to go into some of those do-it-yourself aspects that you can do inside the, the systems. And so um, we have a, about a minute or two into this. So why don't we go ahead and get started, Benjamin? You want to advance here and we can cover things, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Famous. Um, Benjamin. Okay. I'm Benjamin Powell. I'm the director of technical marketing here at um, Risk IQ. So background, I've, I ran uh, network and security teams, um, and then I went over to startups. And so now I'm at Risk IQ, and um, one of the cool things that I do is I spearfish. Um, and but when I tell that to people in our industry, they don't take my emails, but I actually go in the ocean and catch fish. And this is the latest fish I I, I caught off of uh, La Jolla um, about uh, three weeks ago. Um, so it's a little background on myself. Josh, do you want to? You, you always rub that in. I am the farthest that you can be from the. The ocean. I'm in the middle of the country in Austin, Texas, uh, which is you know, very southwest, um, and uh, no oceans nearby, no spear fishing uh, available. And I also come from a little bit of a different background than Benjamin. Benjamin has made a career out of being a practitioner in security, and I'm more of the research variety. So I kind of did it in an academic setting, and in particular, uh, this group that we're going to talk about today, APT29, is the one that I did my graduate thesis on, um, trying to understand the the economics of how they operate. Um, and so what are some of their funding uh, channels and, and how are they uh, generating revenue and how are they funded and the, the economics of the cyber crime underground uh, is my little area of expertise. So uh, not, not the practitioner that Benjamin is, but uh, able to, uh, to ride alongside here and talk a little bit more from that, uh, uh, that academic and research side of, of threat actor hunting and, and threat tracking. So. Um, we'll go ahead and get forward. Now you know who we are, but this is very much a, kind of an open forum. We're, we're going to uh, you know, just talk back and forth uh, and do a sort of commentary. It feels a lot like a podcast in that sense. So um, we also have with us today 
some distinguished guests, uh, John and Kevin from our, our team Atlas. And so I want to give them the opportunity to uh, make a quick introduction and talk about some of their research. Thanks very much. This is Kevin speaking. Um, this is my first time doing one of these workshops, so hopefully it all goes well. Uh, greatly appreciate it. John and I have worked together um, in the past at a couple of other um, security companies and um, also in business for ourselves. Um, we kind of go together like peas and carrots, uh, folks that know us say, in uh, taking different pieces of the puzzle in order to complete the picture. And um, at Risk IQ, we um, have been responsible for launching the Cyber Threat Intelligence Module. Um, uh, yeah, I, I see that there's a question there about seeing me. You know, there's a reason why we're um, off camera and using only our first names. And it has to do with the nature of a lot of the work that we do, which tends to, um, um, you know, uh, which tends to be research about nation state groups or their proxies. And so, um, you know, we, we make the decision often to, um, to, to, to keep some things about ourselves private for that, for that reason, in case anybody's asking about that. Anyway, John, you want to say something in, in by way of introduction? Sure. Uh, so yeah, uh, we're we're and our faces aren't that pretty either. You can always look at Josh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we we definitely have more snarky commentary. But uh, <laughs> so and and my background has been all over the place. Uh, but I've been at a bunch of startups like Mandy and back when they first started, um, NetWitness uh, prior to their acquisition and uh, silence in the early days. So we've been, we've been at this a long time now. Um, and Kevin and I got hooked up together uh, probably like five or six years ago now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working together ever since. So uh, he brings a much needed perspective to a lot of the overly technical things that I'm usually involved in, right? So I've done everything from, you know, reverse engineering malware, reverse engineering network protocols, doing, um, you know, Host forensics, network forensics, basically whatever you can think of. I've probably done it at one time or another. And uh, actually trying to put that in context for what people care about or why it's at all useful. Yeah. And uh, there, there have been a few questions come in and, and some of the chat is going right now as well. Uh, honestly, like the, the whole not show pictures and stuff, it's for our own personal safety. Uh, there are things that uh, we, we go and we find. Uh, and oftentimes it is criminal activity. Uh, oftentimes it is espionage and sometimes it elevates to the point of human rights violations and uh, um, even uh, international uh, crime uh, at, a, at a sort of a treaty level uh, and at a, a human rights level. And so uh, that makes us uh, you know, susceptible to, uh, to harassment or, or direct um, confrontation with those that are doing it. And so uh, anyway, we, we just try to maintain the safety and security. And in fact, today, you're going to see the legal disclaimer here in a bit. This is all live information, okay? This is live internet intelligence. And so even when you click around on things, make sure you're using the utmost caution uh, because uh, it is all real. Uh, this is a real world thing. You're going to come into a lab environment. And I know there was one question that came in about, you know, do I need to register on passive total to use that? We will be using some passive total today. Um, we're going to go through real quick how to get access to the lab environment that we've constructed for you. So if you have a, uh, a passive total account, you'll still be able to use this uh, lab environment. It's, it's based on the Illuminate lab environment. And so uh, you can go ahead and move on from there, Benjamin. But as you can see, there's just a little bit more there when it comes to looking at the attack surface, as well as the CTI, again, that, that threat research. But then in addition, thanks for being here. Um, there's going to be a giveaway at the end of a $75 gift card to Amazon uh, when we conclude today. But we're going to get into all the different tools and, and uh, logins and credentials that you're going to use here in just a moment. But real quickly, again, I mentioned this earlier that we are going to chat through some of the background. And so uh, real quickly, Barrett, I know we have a couple of poll questions. Again, it's not necessarily a poll like trying to you know, get into your personal information or anything like that. It's primarily just to understand the audience. Because when we used to do these in a physical location, Benjamin, we could just, you know, hey, show up hands, who does this and who does this, you know? And, and even beforehand when we're shaking hands, remember when people shook hands? 
um, you know, when yeah, we're the, doing the, that. Big, the big thing is just to, so we have the perspective where you're coming from. So then when we talk about the information, we'll frame it in that perspective. So it's more meaningful to you. That's the whole purpose of this. So first poll question, just real just level setting, engaging here. How long have you, you've been using threat intelligence? So typically, by the way, there's no wrong answer here. Um, when it comes to uh, threat intelligence, typically people say under the five year mark. So it tends to be in those first um, two options or even never. Um, but what we'll do is just give it a moment here. You can see some people are answering. You would just probably 10, 15 seconds, but just gives us again, an idea of just your experience and, and how much um, you've utilized threat intelligence. We'll go ahead and close it now, Barrett, and then see where we stand here again. Yeah. 42% are less than two years, 19% two to five years, 25% more than five years and 14% never. Yeah. So a little bit of a mixed bag um today uh thanks again for answering that we're gonna go into the second real real quick and that's the use case so when you use threat intelligence for those of you that answered that um, it tends to be in these use cases and you can select multiples here incident response um, strategic planning vol management um, some people are out there doing counterattack and takedown as a primary intelligence use case um, third party looking at my extended attack surface and digital supply chain things like that so we'll just give that a second as well. And on the third party one, Benjamin, that's become a real nuisance this year um, with some of these global scale opportunistic style attacks like you know, Sunburst and the exchange situation we had with the Microsoft Exchange servers. Um, increasingly that's become an issue, especially with these, these MSSPs, you know, these managed security service providers, because you know, they get hit, they get popped by one of the systems or tools or platforms they're using, and then it just pushes out to their entire, you know, the tentacles of all of those that they're supporting. Um, we'll go ahead and close that one up. And again, that's multiple, you can select many. 74% um, are instant responders, 63% home management, 33 strategic planning, 48% uh, third party risk management, and 33% counter attack and takedown. And so heavy on the IR, vol management, and third-party risk. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, uh, you know, last one real quick. Uh, I think you'll help me get away with this one. And it's the kinds of threats that you look at. So these threat types, which is my organization is most concerned with these threat types. And so, again, uh, you can select multiples but just want to get an idea of the kinds of threats that you're tracking, the kinds of threats that you're performing intelligence for. Um, so we'll just give that a sec. And uh, the interesting one is that, you know, I think the insider one, you know, 10 years ago, that's what everybody was all concerned about. And it's not, it's not necessarily a threat in a malicious or, or deliberate way. But sometimes that inside the threat is just you know, the, the error, the human error. And so if that's even the kind of threat that you're looking at, you know, hey, it's a threat because of the, um, the propensity of people to make an error, that's, that's fine too. So 41% okay. um, nation state threats, 32% uh, hack division, 47% insider threats, 94% ransomware, and 21% uh, espionage. Um, Domestic cybercrime, 35%, and 65% brand abuse. So it's ransomware and brand abuse and reputation are the highest. What do you think of that? Yeah, so we'll we'll touch upon those things with vulnerabilities and things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, ransomware wasn't even a thing half a decade ago. And here we are, it's the primary concern we, we have today. Anyway, let's get into some of the material, Benjamin. I know we wanted to, to cover uh, some of the, uh, the ways that people can get in and, and follow along and do the laps. Yeah, so what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some copying and pasting into the chat message. So then everyone has all the links and everything that we're doing. So um, instead of you using an account and having a promo code, what we've done is I've created, um, um, we have a lab environment, all the same data and everything. 
but it's under an organization. So if we do want to talk about third party and things, I'll be able to show you those things. Otherwise, it's kind of hard because you might not see any third parties or, or pieces of, of our um, abilities to, to do things. So that's why we're doing it this way. So everyone can use the same credential, uh, ctw at threattracking.com. Um, and um, you can copy and paste the credential in um, to make your life easier. And if you have any issues with it, please let me know and I can, um, Make sure everything's really fine. When you posted it in the chat, Benjamin, you did it uh, just. Oh, I did. To it, I did it to the. I did it to the wrong group. I'm very we all clear. have that, of course. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> I pasted it to the wrong part. Okay, this to everyone. Sorry. Now it's to everybody. So now there's everybody. credentials. And yes. just real quick, we go to the next one. Um, uh, and I, we wanted to uh, talk a little bit about Jupiter. There were some questions earlier. It is open source, so you yeah. can um you can get into it but you won't need to use it for today's labs so just let me know that. and we'll we'll make these um this notebook is will be available afterwards so you can see the type of queries that are there so just let us know if you want to have a copy of it and then when we send out the pdf of all the slides we can send out this this empty notebook to you as well that's right now of course the disclaimer the lawyers rule the world okay so this is real stuff. This is real data. We urge you to use your best professional judgment. We do these workshops every other Thursday. Our community uh, within Risk IQ is over 100,000 security pros. Um, so we know, we, know, we know that you know what you're doing. But the lawyers rule the world. But let's just use our best judgment today. We are clicking around in real stuff. We want those buffer zones between us and the malicious system or infrastructure we're interacting with, but just, again, use your best judgment, proceed with caution. This is real stuff. Um, let's ensure that we are. Uh, uh, it's the air gap. You want to have, you have, you want to have that distance between you and the thing that you're investigating. And if you go there directly, you're giving up information that you're going there directly, or they might filter your traffic and you will never see it. So you want to use um, tools and, and abilities to like, uh, avoid being detected and, and bringing bad malicious things back to your systems or to your organization. So um, we're going to be doing those types of things. Now, um, the things that we're going to talk about is uh, we have John and Kevin that's going to talk about uh, APT29, their past investigations and their new findings and walk through and illuminate um, some of those pivots and, and some of those insights that they found. And um, then we'll take that information that they talked about and I'll, I'll demonstrate the Jupyter Notebook on how that scales that. So you can see that something that might look overwhelming in the, the UI interface could be something that's kind of simple if you're using the API and the notebook. Um, and then we'll talk about some vulnerabilities. So I went out this week and I looked at some of the top um, vulnerability news and there was some information about 40 web appliances having a vulnerability, um, Moodle CMS or learning management systems and then um, for the people that like to go to the gym, you know, this was a uh, Woodify, which is a gym management application. Um, so showing you how to figure out if something is a global problem, you know, um, a problem inside of your own attack surface, uh, or even in your third parties, you'll be able to, to look and see that. And then to be able to see um, what you might need to do to be able to figure out if I have this problem, you know, where would I find the information to fix it? And we'll, we'll go through that through the Vuln management, uh, Vuln intelligence that, that Illuminate has. Okay. Here we go, folks. So of course, when it comes to threat intelligence, security intelligence or real life situations we have to deal with. So number one is digital ate the world and everything got compressed and dematerialized and gone from physical stuff into bits and bytes. So by way of transforming everything into digital, we generated nearly infinite attacker targets, assets, and they're all various and, and strange. When it comes to their appearance and disappearance, it's like hunting dark matter. And so getting visibility is really key when we're going to do threat intelligence, do security intelligence well. Second thing is most of it doesn't matter. Uh, and so making sure that we filter out or filter up uh, that which really is most relevant to us is, um, is a true insight. 
rather than just a pile of research or a pile of data uh, forced onto you. But most of the time we just have part of the picture or it's irregular or inconsistent or doesn't take me into account my attack surface. And so it's not all that insightful, but insight is what we really need. Uh, the other just you know, victim of circumstance situation is that a lot of the time there's not a, a good precise outcome to look for or a precise action to take. Um, and so those can suffer because we don't always have the same response or standard process to follow. Um, we're dealing with a lot of legacy technology or new technologies and making technologies talk and play nice with each other can become a, a burden because even when I have a relevant line of sight to what really matters and it's prioritized and ready to go, the outcome doesn't get realized uh, because again, I'm dealing with a lot of irregularity in this just circumstances of the world that we live in today. And so ultimately we end up having defenses that don't scale to the globe. And that's what we have to do now because we don't live on the internet. We live in the internet all through its layers and tissues. It's more like an ocean than it is like a plane of land that we walk on. It's more in it. Um, and so we're surrounded all around in that internet sphere. And so it can become difficult, but just to break it down real quick, this is a ball, okay? On one side of the ball is blue, and that is our device world that we're used to. And so, of course, like, again, this is just a simple logical process of something bad happens in that device realm of some kind. An alert is detected, a piece of fileless malware is discovered or whatnot. It then pipes up to our endpoint protection, you know, whether that's uh, Defender or CrowdStrike, something from, well, not FireEye, um, but Sentinel, uh, Sentinel One, whatever those different players are that you have out there. I think a few people are still you know, going on with, with McAfee and Envision and all that, but whatever that is, we then get some insights and it's pushed out and apply to all, right? T typical thing. But there's another side of the ball, of the attack surface ball, and that's the digital side. And now we're looking at that as something in the internet occurs that's malicious or problematic. Now we just do the same process, but that's what we do at Risk IQ. We look at its internet relationships, what's relevant to it and my attack surface, and then provide those threat insights to then push out to scale protection to the other endpoint, the internet. Um, and so that's really the basic logic of it, of what we do here at RiskIQ. We cover that other side of the attack surface. Um, and we do so uh, by collecting anything and everything. So we crawl around the whole internet. We map and graph all of the relationships so that you can have some context of what it is actually of what is actually happening out there in the internet. Where again, we've no, you know, we, we've cozied up to new neighbors. Um, the threat actors always lived out there in the internet, uh, but now so do we. And so we have new neighbors and they don't always have the best intentions. Uh, meanwhile, also everything about us in a digital business has become internetized. Uh, our supply chain, our partners, our suppliers, our customers, everyone we interact with is in a digital relationship with us. And so what's really the output uh, from RiskIQ, what really comes of that is a full view of the attack surface. So global unified view tailored to you and your personal attack surface, your personal digital footprint. And then also taking a look at the adversary. What's their digital footprint? Where's their infrastructure? How is it operating? All those loaded guns lying around uh, because, you know, when you are facing a loaded gun, do you really care whose finger is on the trigger? Um, right. And so that's the thing when it comes to threat infrastructure is it can be operationalized by just about anybody. And they, they tend to share with one another. And so being able to adapt to that ethereal world uh, is really important. And so being able to adapt defenses by fingerprinting that adversary infrastructure. And we're going to get into some of those ways that, that Kevin and John are able to do that for us on a day in and day out basis. Um, it's then expressed when it comes to the, uh, the system we're going to use today, Illuminate, in these five areas. So attack surface intelligence, again, what's my view of myself on the internet, uh, security operations intelligence, being able to pipe a lot of feeds and, and flows into all areas of my SOC, um, CTI, and getting into that adversary and fingerprinting their infrastructure, taking a walk into their attack surface and understanding how it operates. Um, that's again, what Kevin and John are going to get into today. Third parties, those I care about, uh, you know, when it comes to intelligence and when it comes to doing intelligence properly to solve some of these challenges, it really comes down to a true understanding of, of me and others, good and bad adversary and ally. And those allies are those third parties that we work with. 
Um, and then of course, getting ahead of vulnerabilities before they become exploits. Um, and so we'll just move right along here, but we're just gonna kind of cover all those different aspects of how intelligence can be applied. Yeah. Um, but let's get into the labs, Benjamin, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. have some fun. So when you, when you think about like, when we make a publication, the, um, the adversary hears about it and they make changes to it. Um, so we adapt just as well as they adapt. So they adapt to change the way that they work um, so we won't find them. And then we have to figure out new ways to figure out where they are or look at new types of data to determine that's them. And so when you think about like Risk IQ, like if we came from our own data center and we were scanning from our own IP space, the bad guys could just filter out the, our traffic and we would never see them. They would disappear. So we have to kind of do what the bad guys do. So we have to go through um, different um, proxies from around the world. We have to look at look like different operating systems and devices. Um, so when we go out and we, we um, crawl the internet, uh, we're doing it as like an actual virtual user. We might do a search, uh, have state, present cookies, do all the things like a regular user would do and act like the intended victim. And I always say like your parents on the internet. Um, so when we go out, we're doing over, you know, 250,000, um, we're seeing over 250,000 new domains resolutions a day. Um, we're doing over 2 billion web requests a day uh, to be able to go out and um, understand the internet. And so from all of these, these services and, and pulling down the full um, document object model, and looking at all the certificates and bringing all this information in, um, it goes into our global inventory. And so when that comes in, uh, security researchers and threat intelligence people like John and Kevin will, will come up with a way of doing a detection. They'll talk with the data scientists that will go into our machine learning algorithms. And as the data flows in, they're able to look at that. But every day we have the capability of when we take that that new day's worth of data and merge it with the old, we can roll back in time and roll that forward. So we're able to have unique data sets that link information together and show you that full infrastructure chain and create even derived data sets to understand you know, the malware, the IoT, the scams, uh, all that things, all those different things, and to be able to, to build that infrastructure chain. So when you think of like starting with a single piece of malware, um, that malware might be associated with an IP and there's a certificate associated with it. That cert might be associated with another IP and a domain and that builds and builds and builds. Um, so when we talk to people that were um, doing investigations, um, actually John was the one that, that figured this out, is that a lot of people would take uh, open source intelligence articles and take that information and run those queries in our system to see if there's anything new that wasn't released in the publication or they didn't know about or to find new indicators. So um, what we did was we launched last year a threat intelligence um, portal where we had all those open source articles and then uh, threat researchers uh, and Team Atlas will go and find additional indicators and give the capability to jumpstart your investigations to have more of that infrastructure determined. So when you read that information, you're able then to piece all these new things together and have a bigger picture of what's happening. Also the ability to look at a domain or IP and get a dynamic risk score to say, hey, this is, um, it's talking about oblique rat and there might be uh, associated with some other indicators that show that this is bad. So it gives you that capability of, of having more of that, that infrastructure identified. So when, you're, when, when you research something or you see something, you're able to make a determination and have that full picture or a more complete picture. So Josh, do you wanna um, take this one? Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately it's what we had mentioned earlier that the attack service is defined by being complex. Like it, it's in the definition of it, okay? It's not just a characteristic or an aspect or a, a thing we could wish away. The very fact that it's digital means it's complex. The very fact that it's digital means it's dynamic. Because again, we've, we've dematerialized it. It's not physical stuff anymore. It's bits and bytes, it's ones and zeros. And so as such, that allows attackers and adversaries to hide in plain sight because they can nestle down into the folds of that digital soup 
uh, and continue to obfuscate themselves unless like, you know, Kevin or John come along. Um, but then we'll go on to the next one. Yeah. And so when we, when we get into this, this is where John and Kevin are going to take over to talk about APT 29 and um, we'll, we'll start on the slide and then John or Kevin are going to show their screens and they're going to walk through and talk about the previous investigations and the, the new stuff that they found, um, which was pretty exciting um, um, to, to see the, the new infrastructure that they found. So John and Kevin, I'll let you guys start. Thanks. Um, that was that was a great great introduction. By the way, I, I feel um, you know one of the reasons I think John and I really like working at Risk IQ is it's just the amount of data that is available to us here and that we're working to make available to you. Um, there's there's really quite a lot of exciting stuff going on here. So uh, I just want before we start talking about this particular bit of research and this investigation. Um, and, and John is going to walk you through eventually sort of how we started the technical analysis part. Um, it's probably worth noting a few things for context so that you can understand, um, you know, why we approached this subject and um, uh, what we were responding to in terms of an intelligence requirement. Threat intelligence practitioners sometimes are responding to requirements that are given to them by customers. Um, and sometimes they are sort of self-generating requirements based on research that they are doing. We fall into that latter category. As part of the effort to build a cyber threat intelligence module in the Illuminate product that was just shown to you, we, John and I are, are, uh, are going through the process of building profiles of common nation state actors and criminal groups, as well as commonly abused pen testing tools like Cobalt Strike and Interpreter, as well as commonly seen malware backdoors, right? Like Poison Ivy or Plug X and things like that. Mm -hmm. And as we're building these things, sometimes we stumble upon interesting findings that we feel are worth sharing with a wider audience. So that's where this bear tracks um, blog post came from, and uh, you'll see it on the right side of the slide there. And um, so that's that's the first thing you should you should know when or have in mind when we're talking about it. The second thing you should know is that you know traditionally threat intelligence practitioners rely and incident responders rely on on three main sources of data, and and some of them are. Oh, you know, one of them, are, of course, are malware samples. The other one is network infrastructure. And the third one is, is any kind of like target specific telemetry that might come from directly from a victim. And uh, you should know that uh, at Risk IQ, given the, the, uh, the abundance of data that we have on internet intelligence, we focus more heavily on the network infrastructure piece of it. Um, and so, Often the tactical intelligence, meaning like the new indicators of compromise that we that we turn up in our research, typically falls in that category, right? We do, of course, where we can give you information about other indicators of compromise that cover that touch those other those other areas, but we're primarily focusing on the network. Um, and the last thing to talk about, and probably a good way of jumping off into the actual subject matter here, is, is we're talking about APT29. And I don't know if everybody here is familiar with that, AP, that moniker. That is a FireEye term um, that uh, refers to a group that is also called the Dukes um, and uh, Cozy Bear. The Dukes is the Kaspersky group. Uh, uh, term for it. Cozy Bear is the CrowdStrike term for it. Uh, but this is a group that, um, uh, uh, that, that some governments um, have, have assessed is acting in the interest of the Russian government, um, specifically the, the SVR or Foreign, Foreign Intelligence Service. Um, some other governments in Europe have previously associated this group with the FSB, which is the Russian Domestic Intelligence Service, as well. Um, this is also the same group that the U.S. government decided uh, is responsible for the 
espionage campaign that targeted solar, solar winds. Um, and that's worth noting because the private industry research that you'll see into solar winds um, associates it with a different actor they call uh, uh, Nobelium or Stellar Particle or UNC 2452 threat intelligence, private threat intelligence teams can only make an assessment based on um, activity matching a pattern that they've seen previously. And this Russian group uh, is particularly adept at pattern avoidance. It's one of the things that makes them very hard to track in general. Uh, they, 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 tr they, they understand the way in which threat hunters pursue them and take actions that are designed to avoid creating a pattern that would make finding them easy. So anyway, so you should know that when we're talking about the group, the APT responsible here, we're making an assessment based on our judgment uh, and our years of experience and the patterns that we were able to actually pick out um, that this group took pains to try to avoid creating. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so those are the, those are the, the couple of just general, general things I want you to keep in mind while, while you're doing this. So we started our investigation um, you know, a, a, a number of months ago as we were building the profile for this group in the cyber threat intelligence model. And we had previously published some research about solar winds. And um, we, had, we had succeeded in that case in discovering um, additional command and control servers uh, that were associated with that campaign based on our ability to match patterns on how this adversary set up their command and control servers. And that's essentially the same kind of technique that we used here. And so um, the, the Bear Tracks um, uh, blog post, let me see if I can share a screen here. Yeah, let me, I'm gonna stop sharing and then oh, yeah. you can share. Okay, okay. thanks. Yeah, so this is in our threat intelligence portal now, and it should be available to everybody. Um, uh, it, it has to do with um, the identification of, 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 uh, of, of more than two dozen newly discovered command and control servers that we believe were serving a kind of malware called WellMess or WellMail. And that's the name of a backdoor. Okay, and it is a piece of malware that was discovered a number of years ago by the Japanese CERT. Um, and they published on it, but did not associate it with any targets or a threat actor. They just kind of said, here's a new piece of malware and here's how it works. Um, later, uh, actually just about this time last year, the British government uh, NCSC, National Cybersecurity Center, in a joint analysis that they made public, that they completed with the uh, US government and the Canadian government, um, uh, shed more light on well mess and well mail. And what they did in their research was to associate it explicitly with APT 29 and to and of course, they also in that in that analysis made an assessment that that group was uh, essentially uh, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, and they talked about what the targeting was at the time. And um, a, a year ago, uh, as you as you recall, unfortunately, we're having kind of a deja vu um, flashbacks to this uh, now. Um, was the you know the, the COVID pandemic was sort of. Um, was really climbing. It was, you know, it was it had everybody on edge. It had governments on edge uh, in terms of uh, the race to get a vaccine developed and um, and and rolled out to protect the population. And so that became a juicy intelligence target um, for foreign governments. Um, APT twenty nine, um, if uh, you know, in, in its capacity as an agent of the of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service frequently is observed uh, targeting the kinds of um, 
the kinds of organizations that would further sort of government objectives. So, you know, defense and military targets, uh, political um, agencies and organizations, but also think tanks and research institutions where, um, where policies uh, or where uh, technology that is uh, that has significant policy implications are being developed. And so the uh, Brits and the Americans and the Canadians in their report of a year ago um, described the use of well mess, which they determined to be a custom backdoor that is only used by this group, um, that had been used in targeting uh, COVID-19 research efforts in those three Western countries. Okay, so uh, at the time, and, and, and John can explain this, I think, retroactively when, when we pass, at the time, we published an article where we were able to expand upon the, the known network infrastructure that was published by the Western governments in that advisory. And, um, uh, and so, um, you know, what, one of the things that, that I'm sure if, if you're like us, um, you're, you're likely to do once you find something like that is you keep watching it over time. And you look to see if you can discern a pattern in the way in which this uh, infrastructure and malware is interacting so that you can find it again. Because of course, whenever any of these advisories or research is made public, the, it, it's not just um, network defenders and other analysts like yourselves that are watching, uh, the adversaries are watching the adversaries are watching too. Um, and so they adjust and they change what they're doing. It turns into a game of um, cat and mouse, typically. Uh, and you have to try to figure out where they've moved to before um, we, you lose sight of them. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. John. I was, I was going to take over and just start showing some of the stuff. So yeah, um, that's pretty good background, right? And so we, we really started... Uh, probably back in July, June, uh, when the NCSC first released their their report, right on APT twenty nine targeting, um, you know, COVID nineteen research, and from there, here I'll I'll share my screen now. Uh, okay. Maybe share this with me. Let's make sure we don't have anything crazy up. <laughs> yeah, you guys can see this. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, and why is this? So I can see it too. So in here, right? Uh, basically, this is this was a pivot that we used to identify more infrastructure. Um, and if you actually look at the dates, um, you can go back and see that the report was sort of right uh, before they stood all this stuff up here, uh, or I should say, <coughs> uh, <laughs> around that same time the report was published. And so a lot of the infrastructure also got some, they spun some new stuff up, right? And they spun a bunch of old stuff down, the IPs that have been reported. So if you actually, you guys, you guys should be able to do this in your browsers too, if you want to follow along. I don't, I don't know if that's useful for you or not, yeah. or if it's, if it's clear enough John, on my screen. John, can but, you copy the URL and just paste it in? Yeah, I'll paste it into the chat. So, yeah. Yeah, so you guys don't have to try to guess what that is. And then explain, you know, what, what, what. Yes, the I will explain is. the facets here. Okay, as perfect. Soon as I can chat. Zinga. Okay, so this is, this is the actual query. Um, and what this is saying is, show me all of the SSL certificates that RiskIQ has where the subject country uh, that we parse out from the certificate, obviously, matches uh, Tunis, right? And it turns out Tunis was kind of a bad, bad country pick on this one, right? And so this is one of the things that they learned from and they modified when they went and created new certificates because this certificate was literally, with this subject country, it was only used by, you know, this particular actor. So they, they, <laughs> they kind of uh, they kind of hosed themselves, right? By using the same pattern across all their command and control servers, right? You're able to definitively link them together in a unique way that is not used anywhere else on the internet, right? And this, since we're scanning pretty much all the time, like Benjamin and, and Josh mentioned, we see this on like a daily basis, right? So when these things first come up, when we last saw them, 
right? And we get, you know, normally within 12 to 24 hours of when these things are up or down on the internet. So this was literally all of the old infrastructure that got published. And if you sort by last seen descending, you'll actually see that a bunch of these servers were up past when the NCSC had published and they continue to operate and actually quite a few are still up. Um, and that is actually how we were able to link together the kind of new information that we found with the old information was that these things really hadn't gone away, right? Like the, the reports basically hadn't really affected any of these servers. I don't know if they're being monitored right or not, but uh, you know, it didn't affect them from an operational standpoint and they, they didn't care enough to turn them off essentially. Um, whether or not they're still being used, right? That's not something that we could say, right? Without flow data, um, which is one of the things that we're in the process of building into the product, um, right? So you, you would see actual endpoints communicating to and from this. Um, and we have some integrations coming soon in, with respect to that. So this is all in regards to basically the old stuff that had been published by the NCSC and into the new stuff, right? I, I happened upon this on, on Twitter, right? I was like, oh, that's neat. And there was just an IP address. It's really all we needed, right? And he was like, maybe this is a, a new well mess thing, right? He linked out to a sample, um, you know, he wasn't sure. So we, we checked on his work, right? And so this is the exact, I, the, the exact new IP address that he mentions. It's in the, one of the things to note um, that can actually be useful is it's in the same net block as one of the previous command and control servers. So if you actually take. John, I'm pasting these in as you're going. Yeah, uh, can you see this? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's not the direct classy, but it's in the, it's basically in the same provider net block. So these guys actually didn't bother to switch up providers, right? And, and one of the things that, you know, cyber criminals and nation state actors rely upon is hosting infrastructure that accepts, you know, cryptocurrency as payment, right? So some form of anonymity, right? Between how they're actually purchasing, purchasing the servers, right? It, this, is, this is especially true for people that set up their own infrastructure versus use compromised infrastructure. Um, and these guys typically uh, will set up their own infrastructure. Some of the other groups, right, will use compromised infrastructure. But with that, right, you have to worry about potentially other people compromising the same systems, right, in the way that you did to get into them. Um, so this, this, right, is just a, a way for them to secure their operations, right, so to speak. So when looking at this, uh, you know, I know if you haven't been in the platform before, some of this is overwhelming and you may not even know about it, right? But one of the things that <clears throat> I, I didn't even know about at well, right? I was, I was basically like a power user of passive total since its inception, right? Since it was just an idea that Brandon had. Uh, and I had no idea that this, this little button here existed because normally it's closed. Um, this analyst insights, um, and this will actually tell you a number of different things and can actually have useful information in it every now and again. Um, not in this particular case, but this is just something for you to know. Um, and one of the other things that we noticed with most of the command and control servers as well was they were all not hosted in the United States, uh, with the exception of one of them, right? And uh, this group has, you know, traditionally targeted European governments, um, you know, Asian governments, other, I guess, strategically important targets, right? And in this particular case, right, you're not going to get a whole bunch other than, oh, cool, look, it's Shinjiru technology, right? If, if you're familiar, right, they, they accept Bitcoins and they were behind, you know, one of the you know, privacy focused registrars, right? So, um, but going into here, uh, trackers is one of the places where we put, hopefully this loads, where we put all of the things that we think are unique to like the IP or website like if this what like so Google, you know, analytic IDs, um, certain other type of like web bugs will get populated in here. But we've more recently added, right, like jarm hashes. So you could potentially, right, like see if this jarm hash is unique, um, right? But in this case, if we go do that, you're going to see it's on 102,000, which is probably not going to be super helpful unless you can filter it more. 
Um, but when we go in here and you look at the actual certificates, well, the other thing to note too is the components here will actually show you, I don't know if this will show you necessarily, but it'll show you basically that an Apache web server was running on a specific port, right, for a certain period of time. Um, whether or not that's related to the threat actor, we don't really know, right? But the other information it's pulling out is, is related, it's pulling this out of the, the SSH banner, essentially, right? So they're just running SSH on port 22. Um, and you can actually see that when you click over here in services, you can actually see what boxes this guy's running. So, um, and one of the things here is, uh, you know, it's got a couple different ports open, right? And they're, in this case, they're both serving the same like SSL certificate, but we've seen instances where they have actually started to respond to the information that we've published and started to change the certificates that they used. So let's go take a look at the certificate. So, and uh, try to show you this and just do a comparison here. We'll grab one of these so you can see it, right? Where they, <clears throat> and they pretty much set up all the other ones similarly with a, a common name of star, blah, 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 and the country matching here. So one of the things that we noticed immediately was this is taking the, I don't know if you can see it all the way down in the bottom corner there, where it says certificate subject country IL. So that's Israel, um, where the issuer subject country is actually, I think ZA is South Africa, right? So really uncommon for certificates to have a, an issuer and a subject country that don't align, right? Um, I mean, it, it could obviously happen, right? Depending if somebody's buying something from someone else overseas, whatever else, right? But by and large, and, and we'll show you later when we get to it, that is relatively uncommon, right? So something that you probably don't wanna do if you're trying to hide your stuff. Um, the other thing that they try to do here is match more common things, right? So they tried to match common fields. And if you actually look for thought consulting, it's a, it's a real thing. And you'll see here in a second, hopefully, this that you know we see it on 56,000 certs um one of the things that i like to check though uh, a lot of times is recency right so if you actually sort on first scene descending um in this case you'll see that most of the ones using that thought consultancy are actually uh old older right legitimately um so potentially something where you could go through and try to manually verify these but I kind of just immediately skipped it given its overall number like across the internet. Um, however, right, this is, this is potentially interesting here. I don't, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but right, this is the one that we just came from uh, and it's a newer certificate. So <clears throat> it's one of the ones that they updated and changed. Uh, the other thing to note here is the subject common name. So in this case, uh, I won't do it, but if you do a quick like NS lookup for that domain, you'll see that it doesn't actually resolve to anything, which is another, uh, you know, super uncommon feature. Um, and the big one here was using the subject organization name of a startcom LTD period, right? So turns out that this was in fact used legitimately at one point in time, right? But this, the certificates that it was used so if you guys don't know and you're not familiar, uh, pass a total defaults to showing you a relatively limited number of things just so the screen loads faster, um, but you can change the default sometimes to actually see all of them on one page, which is what we're gonna do right now. And I'll paste this so you guys can see this too. So I'm gonna paste I did it. already, I already did it for did you. It? Okay, thank yeah. you Ben. I'm just following uh, behind you. Everything you're doing, I'm pasting. Okay, work. perfect. Sorry, I'm I'm not keeping up. I gotta I gotta remember. Uh, no worries. <laughs> go slower. Uh, so in here, you'll see right away that some of these certificates, right, are probably legitimate. They're on you know fifty thousand, sixty thousand, five hundred thousand hosts. But again, one of the things that I like to do, right, is if you actually sort on first scene descending here, right, this tells you when Risk IQ first saw it on the internet. Uh, Right, we see around, well, really, 
October 9th, right? They start to use this new certificate pattern. And if you actually look at this, you'll see that they use the same subject country of Israel and a different issuer country. I don't know if they tried to make that so that, it, you know, a lot of the times actors will go out of their way to try to obfuscate one way of detecting their, their infrastructure, uh, thereby creating a different way of doing it, right? So the fact that they had Tunis in both things previously was an easy way to verify it, right? But now they tried to change that, right? So that their infrastructure is not discoverable. And in doing so, they created yet another distinct pattern, uh, which makes it you know, clearly obvious. And again, all these subject, so I don't know why we sometimes show things up here versus down here, but all the subject uh, common names are going to be domains that don't resolve. Right, another clear pattern that you're doing it wrong. Why? Why they did this? No idea, right? But I would assume it's just, you know, some script, right, that's spitting these certificates out during their build process for setting these servers up. Um, and so you can actually go through, like we did for the one IP, see all the ports and services that are open on these, right? And basically, what when we first saw it or last saw it, right? So these ones from the beginning, right? One of them's still up. I don't know which one this is, but we won't click on it. Um, and anyway, I'll just show you that the, uh, you know, if you actually go through here and you look at the individual details of each of these, you'll see that they basically follow the same pattern. The issuer uh, organization name will change and they've actually used legitimate issuer organization names, probably copying them from various places. Um, right, like here, let's, let's encrypt, I mean, the, that's just silly, right? Uh, using a Let's Encrypt cert is, right, obviously a uh, uh, pro and a con, right, in that it's free, but they didn't even bother to do that here, right? And, they, and they're using, these are all self-signed certificates, right? So they'll have a chain count of one, right? And I don't know that we, so one of the things that uh, Kevin and I's team is working to do is expose more of Risk IQ's backend data into the actual like passive total platform so you can search through it in the same way same ways right that we can um but ssl certificates is one of the things that the platform currently i feel like does really well even if we're not showing you necessarily all of the information that we have about it we at least show you relevant information right and so you can actually go through right and this is basically what we did is, is went through each of these and validated that you know it matched sort of the patterns that we had discovered in their infrastructure, uh, right? So that they, they made a lot of mistakes, I guess I should start with. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to go through all of them, obviously, right? But this particular one of just using a single subject, organiza subject organization name allows you to link all these certificates um, together. And if you, if you look at each one of these, they basically all follow the same pattern of some randomly issued, you know, subject common name. And then <clears throat> that doesn't resolve to anything. But right. curiously, right, this is this is one of the newer certificates, right? And they use the same subject organization name. And they they made both of these match now, a better idea, right? And then they have, but they just have a, sub, a common name of star. So I was I was curious about that. Like how common is that, right? Are there are there literally that many wild carded subject common names? And hey, John, did you explain already that that our jumping off point for this this trail that you're you're talking about with the with the cert was was actually something that we saw on Twitter? Yeah, I, I started with the tweet. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was literally one IP, right? And from one IP, we branched out and basically found, you know, to start with, I don't know how many different IPs this is, a handful, twenty or so. Um, and then we also identified. I'll stop sharing and pull up the other one because I don't. I don't have it off again. Um, but there was, a, there was another pattern that we basically identified in the infrastructure that also linked all these together. And if we went back and we cross-correlated these IP addresses and the net blocks that they belong to with the ones that had been used previously, and there was like 70 or 80% crossover. So they're all basically coming from the same providers that these people had already established accounts with, right? Because it's hard to set up fake personas and actually buy equipment. Um, and in this particular case, right, we were able to, so if you go to the services tab, you'll see what's running on each of these IPs. 
And I'll let you guys play around with this while I'm talking, but you'll basically see they, they more or less have the same ports open on all of them, 22, 80, 443. Some of them will have 8443. Some of them will have 25, depending on what, um, basically what, what versions of the back doors they're running, right? And you can see here, this is another one, right? Where they've tried to modify their certificate pattern to avoid detection, right? Where they've now, they're now not using a common name uh, right, but they're using an organ and they're matching the organization name and the country name. I don't know if this is in response to us or they're just, you know, doing it for. for yeah, but, but it's always this cat and mouse game that when you find yeah, the way to find it, and once we publish, that's the that's the issue is they, that everything you publish, they, they change. Well, so, right, it, it's all a matter of uh, how, what is your view of the total internet? Do you know how many systems look like that? Right. And can you make it look like everything else? And with a lot of what they're doing, the answer is no. So we're not going to share all the ways that we can necessarily fingerprint this. Right. But um, you know, maybe maybe it'll come out in a future publication. But uh, needless to say, there's lots of interested parties in what the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service is doing. Um, so, so can can you mention like when you when the the funny thing that I thought was Biden had just said. Hey, I spoken with yeah. with Russia, and um, they're no longer going to be hacking us, you know. And then, <laughs> then, then we get your 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 article. Where we go, well, they stood up all this new stuff immediately after speaking with you. Yeah, you know? well, it's actually not too long after. Um, yeah, and one of the pattern. Uh, it's not this pattern, but it's the other one. So let me stop sharing. Okay, that went up, so I'm not. Yeah, that's something in general. That's something that we pay attention to. And, and it's something that John and I uh, wish researchers would include when they're publishing um, network indicators of compromise or discussing network infrastructure in their research, their public facing research, is the time period during which the infrastructure is malicious. Uh, in IP in a domain, you know, they're, they're, these things come in and out of that state of being, of being malicious or being used by an adversary. You know, once an IP is marked as bad, doesn't mean it's always bad. So right. looking looking to make sure you understand when that particular server is in use by this group. Ideally, you know, if you can match it to what kind of malware it's interacting with, that gives you a lot more, um, I think, valuable information, valuable context that in this case, Benjamin, you're right, was, was yeah. something that we definitely keyed in on. We were right. looking specifically looking to see whether or not any APT29 infrastructure was in play uh, after, when was that? June 16th, there was a summit between presidents of the, of the United States and Russia. Right. Cyber was at the top of the, of the, of the discussion list. And, um, you know, it, it drove the news cycle for a few days. So we wanted to see whether or not um, this group uh, was responsive to that as well. And as it turns out, they were. They were. In, in the <laughs> sense that they didn't care. They just kept going. <laughs> so this is this is one of the interesting pieces, right? Is is of these three newer command and control servers that were set up, one of them is inside the United States. Um, Right, and so if you actually look, this is uh, well. You could go, you could go track this down in some other platforms, right, and figure out that this this IP is actually in San Jose, right. Um, and this has been one of their hallmarks is is using infrastructure in country of the targets that they're going after, so that it doesn't look like anomalous communications from a you know a network perspective. Right? You don't have. Yeah. Right. Just from just from endpoint data, right? Flow data that you don't have connections to a country that you don't expect to talk to. Right. If you're if your machine's speaking to talking to Russia and you don't do business there and you're you're doing net flow internally in your organization, that's a red flag. But if it's yeah. going to San Jose, you go, well, that's Silicon yeah. Valley. There's so many things there. There, Facebook, oh, there's yeah. Cisco, and, there's everybody. And everybody's using cloud hosting at this point. So we right. see a lot of stuff across, you know, Google, Amazon. All sorts of other things, um, you know, and it, and it was kind of it's kind of rare to see them use a U.S. endpoint. They very rarely do that, um, except when they had U.S. targets, right? So, and this came almost two, three weeks after that summit. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and 
you know, that, that was kind of the impetus. It was like, oh, we found a bunch of stuff, but what does it mean, right? And like trying to put context around it, when it happened, uh, is it still active, right? And so that's, that's definitely one of the th- most important things with threat intelligence, especially if you're trying to consume threat intelligence from outside parties is knowing like, first, does it affect your organization, right? And then when was it active? Is it still active, right? Because a lot of the times people are writing about things that are historic and right. they're burning, they're, they're, they're only writing about things that they don't care about because they've already tracked the changes. So right. knowing, knowing that, you know, if you're, if you're just consuming information that gets pushed out by other parties, chances are, and you care about whatever that threat actor is, chances are that is that you're probably already behind. Yeah. It's, it's after it's history. It's not, it's not reality. It's, it's, well, it's historic, right? And, historic, and after, yeah. they, after they publish, you can pretty much guarantee that whatever information they published will, will have a very short half-life, right? It's only going to be good for a month, maybe, maybe two, um, before you see that same threat actor modify what they're doing. Yeah, right. The whack a mole thing, theory. Exactly. You got it. And yeah. so having that time based context around when things are actually malicious is huge. Right. And that's that's why the tooling is so important to understand because if you can track that tooling, um, that's that's a good way to fingerprint because if they're using specific things to do their attacks, if you link that infrastructure together and you have a way of protecting your organization from that tooling, it can help you in the long run. That's true. Although, you know, it's worth noting that you know, it's been a trend for, for a couple of years now that, that um, many of these state-backed APT groups have been using commodity malware, have been using tools that are available to everyone, right? right? That are, um, you know, like commercially available pen testing tools in theory, um, but which can be turned to to bad ends, right? Okay. So yeah. they try to blend in with the with this is well this 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 just goes to to to, um, to emphasize how important it is to to try to um, hone your skills in hunting within network infrastructure because that is something that is more difficult for adversaries to um, to it's more difficult for them to blend in as John was saying earlier, right? Yeah. For, well, for them to make their their command and control server configurations and the way things are set up behave in a way that makes it difficult to find. You know, right. the peculiarities, it's all about sort of finding peculiarities on the network side as instead of on the targets side, right? What's hitting the target is kind of the way the rest of the industry has been doing this, you know, picking up the malware, you know, sorting through the pieces that were left behind, the breadcrumbs left behind. We're trying to take that um, that approach and, 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 you know, we're still doing that where we can, but then we're, we're turning more of our attention to what's going on with, with the attackers command and control server. And yeah. It's the that. attack surface intelligence of like their footprint on the internet, mapping that the adversary, it, footprint. Yeah, the adversary footprint. Yes. Uh, it's, it's the difference of going to the, where, where the nuclear blast happened and checking out the crater and getting out your, uh, Gigometer and looking at the is it uranium or plutonium is it yellow cake uranium or uh, some other variety and that's the typical way that we try to then fingerprint who did this. Correct. It's it's more effective if you just go to where the nuclear yeah. find uh, all the silo is where the launch pad was right. and check out who owns it um, who who has access into that area and who has the launch codes to send it out um, and not wait for the crater. Uh, after the fact. Right. Um, and again, we said this earlier, you know, when you're facing a loaded gun, do you really care who's on the other end of it? They are using commodity malware. They are using commodity pen test products, open source system that any one of us can go and grab right now. Right. And, and so there. when you shield yourself against the thing that actually harms you, um, that's where you, you benefit. Uh, you, can, you can spend all day, John, I know we talk about this all the time, right? You can spend all day profiling the threat actor, understanding who they like to vacation with, what their favorite color is, what they studied in school. I mean, I did that. I did that uh, in an academic setting. You can do all of that and still get hit, hit hard, uh, because the one that you weren't paying attention to still had the same weaponry. Well, there's uh, no technical solution. Yeah. There, there's, yeah. there's no real easy technical solution 
to, to, to block a nation's foreign intelligence service, particularly a sophisticated one. That's not a threat that you can just put on a blacklist and block or a block list rather and, and just say, I'm done. Um, the, you know, these, these are groups that, so understanding how these adversaries behave, what, what their targeting is, as well as what specific infrastructure and malware they're using in a particular campaign, all of that is important. It's going to be different pieces of that are going to be important to different people, which is why we try to put together these publications in a way that we're uh, that we're, we're sort of targeting, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, folks in the SOC or or inside a network defense or an IT uh, department within an organization who may be a target and just need things to block, right. as well as people up the chain from that, so they understand who's in the risk profile for this group. Um, how do they generally operate so that you can try to anticipate it? It's about being reactionary and, you know, in some cases, yes, tactically, but also trying to anticipate um, what might be coming next. Um, and, and that's part of the, the CTI is, is having identified that, that infrastructure and the related infrastructure that they're commingling. In. That's right. right. And so show you, right. Everything on uh, the internet that looks like that thing. Right. right. And that's that's our goal to basically bake that into the platform. Right? right. So that you if you have any singular piece of Intel, right, we can basically tell you everything else that looks like this. Uh, and the mag the magic part of this is this actually this actually exists on our back end. We're right. just trying right. to bring it out to the public. Right. Uh, and we're and we're essentially like an open source, you know, we're like an open source intelligence company. Right. I mean, this is that what, what I mean to say is that the, the results that we that we've come up with here uh, mm -hmm. in this particular investigation did not rely upon having access to a victim system. Right. Right. We didn't have to go. We didn't go do incident response. Right. At one of the targets. In fact, we don't even know who the targets are here. <laughs> right. right? G given the view, g given where we sit. Nevertheless, uh, we were able to do, I think, some very and, and soon hopefully everybody uh, who's a user passive total will be able to do this too. Um, you, you know, you can take one piece of information that's out there in the public and you can expand it and find everything else that looks like that. And, um, and, and this has, as you can imagine, uh, significant implications if you're talking about a group that uses ransomware, because you can try to anticipate what servers are being set up to distribute it. So right. it's not just, it's not just, oh, I'm never going to be a target of the Russian government. That may be true, but we're doing this for uh, lots of different kinds of groups that have lots of different kinds of ends in mind and who operate in cyberspace, not just in, in you know in pursuit of espionage, but in pursuit of sabotage and pursuit of and pursuit of financial crime, you know. Um, and for all the incident responders on the call, you guys know that you definitely want a complete picture of what's happened inside your networks before you go try to remediate, right? Otherwise you're just back in the same situation, you know, 30 yeah. days later. Yeah. Um, you can't leave that, any remnants of, of the bad guy in your infrastructure, so you need to have the full picture. Yeah. Well, and, and no, no advanced actor relies on a single back door, right? So you if, if you do see one of these things in an environment, chances are good that there's other things in the environment too, right? And so it's, it's more, trying to find all the things that are connected in much the same yeah. way, right? And so we're only looking at a small piece of this, right? But the actual people doing the defense here, you gotta look at everything. You gotta look at the hosts, which hosts talk to which, right? Not just network endpoints. Yeah, right? We should say before you move on to the to the Jupyter Notebook thing, Benjamin, yeah. I just wanted to, to to share one other thing, if I may. Sure, Do, uh, I'll, I'll we, don't, stop. we don't know, sure. yeah, just one second, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, stop sharing my screen. Which is sort of the result. The result of this particular investigation, as we said, we don't know exactly. Um, we don't know exactly uh, who the targets were, and we're making an assessment, of course, based on our real-time investigation, as was described at the, at the beginning. Right, the intelligence game is never one of absolute certainty. Right, um, but we felt pretty confident that our assessment of this particular use of a command and control infrastructure to distribute that malware was associated with this group, APT29. And sure enough, a few days later, we saw a tweet um, from the, the official account of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of yes. the Russian government, um, throwing some shade on us, basically. Uh, and uh, 
I, I don't know if that's a, a, a no comment denial or a tacit acknowledgement that we had touched a nerve. Uh, I kind of want to think it's the latter, but uh, regardless, it certainly caught their attention. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. it's really, it's really cool. It's like a, with that to happen because I think that's the first time they've ever responded to like a company saying something. I think that means we won. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, the techniques that you're using are, are a way to identify a pattern and apply that to threat actors or tooling or different things. And it's, it's a game changer when you can do that at scale. Um, because once you can identify all that stuff, it's very easy to, to find those things in the environment and let people know. And that's like kind of illuminate, illuminate it and, and let people know about this is what you need to pay attention to. And this is how it's changing. So as we're crawling the internet every day, finding new information, finding what's changing, what's being patched, what, what's being installed, you look for those patterns and you can find them and say, here's the grouping of things that you should be aware of. That, that are probably suspicious or malicious. And that's where the reputation and score comes in and things like that. Yeah, and I was just gonna say a lot of people were concerned with ransomware. Uh, you guys should know that these ransomware operators are generally lazy, right? And if you've been paying attention, you've seen some of the leaks from you know Conti operators or affiliates, right? They're following a playbook and they're, they're doing things in a certain way every time. Uh, and I'll just say like, if you are concerned about those specific, you know, operators, you, you can find all their stuff if you go look for it. Yeah. Uh, Any questions from the audience that have come in that um, during our discussion? Any questions? Okay. So while, um, what we'll do is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show the Jupyter notebook um, that um, Mark Kendrick and I um, talked about yesterday. He threw this together based upon the discussion because I was telling him what the workshop was going to be. And um, he goes, oh, I can show you how to do that. Very simple. I just made a new update and um, you can do that today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this and then I'll walk through um, what we did. So let me say run all, here we go. So what it's doing is it's looking at that initial IP address. It's grabbing the certificates and say, here are all the certificates. Then it went through and said, hey, get me the, the ones that are, are running right now and um, take um, the ones that don't match in the countries that we just did. So it's looking at the subject country and the issuer country and show me the ones that don't match. Okay, so then it went through and said, hey, let's go with that, that star, um, Startcom one and grab those. So it went through and it's grabbing those and it's filtering them out. So if we take a look at this, here are all the ones that don't match and here are all the certs and here are all the IP addresses associated with them. There's like, um, 2,300 of these that are listed here. And then I even went through and added the dates. This is something that like the start and end date. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit cause it's a little bit hard to see. Um, but this script basically goes through and grabs that type of data, finding the ones that don't match that pattern that John and Kevin talked about and said, well, here they are. And here are the dates when it was first seen, last seen that you can filter and now see. Uh, and then you can go through and, and if this was John or Kevin, they would go through and, and verify the details or look for other indicators inside there and, and merge those together to really identify those. But you can see, I ran this in a couple seconds and there it was. So um, this is the way that you can automate those types of investigations to like, if you had to run it again, once you've created the notebook, you can run this notebook again, see, are there any new things today? And you can run it on a scheduled basis, have them copy the data, put it in your block list, look at your, your NetFlow traffic. Is anybody communicating to any of these IPs? Um, those are the type of things that you could, you could easily do. Um, but this is some new stuff that um, 
we're capable of doing with Inside Jupyter Notebook because of the, the great work that um, Mark Kendrick has done to enhance the ability to pull in the data and let you do those iterative searches to say, now that I got this big block of data, go through and filter this, show me this, match on these items, or um, when they don't match, show me those items. And so that's that's what this, this notebook gives us that capability. And we can make this available to you. We'll just, um, it's it all started from exactly what we uh, showed today with that initial query um, to grab that those the all the search find the one that was that was um, running today. Here's that let's encrypt certificate, um, and then using those as the as the filter points to bring that information in, and then doing a new query on that that organization name, the Startcom. Yeah, I was I was just going to chime in that if you haven't, if you're a user of Passive Total from the past, uh, definitely, and you want to do anything at scale, definitely take a look at the APIs. They're not as scary as they seem. Right. Uh, and I didn't really do much with them until I joined the company, and now I pretty much don't use the UIs anymore, <laughs> truthfully. But the AP, the APIs are amazing, right? And it's repeatable. Yeah. You get all the information, and you can basically spit it out in whatever format you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So look at all these, all this infrastructure, where it doesn't match. I'm just well, so that one cert, that one cert Benjamin, the one that's that's repeating there, you, yeah. you have to filter that one out because that's actually one of the legitimate ones. Okay. Uh, uh, like all the ones that are more recent, right? Yeah. Uh, where it's like Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, like those are actually malicious. Okay. Keeps me honest. That's what. That's the good thing about this is we want to make sure that we're we're giving you the right information. Here's the Taiwan one. So yeah, but this is this is like how you could take those the information that you you figure out from your investigation and then scale it um, to look for these patterns and find that data and and really uh, expand your investigations uh, in a timely fashion. Everybody, everybody following along with that on the on the call side. I know we went through that really quick and I know that some folks here today might not be as familiar with Jupiter. And Everybody in the talk? future, we'll do one that's just a Jupiter notebook yeah. um, um, event where we'll go through and build a notebook and do some investigations. But we want I wanted to show like the, the amount of data that John and Kevin look at is overwhelming. And to go through the UI and try to figure it out and do it, that's why they use the API because they can run a query, get a subset and drill down and really get down to the, um, the exact things that they're looking for uh, quickly. Um, but they probably have to go look, you guys probably have to go look spot check and look in the UI just to see if there's other patterns. Is that kind of what you do? We're, we're always double checking. We're always yeah. doubting ourselves. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's amazing. It's like, it's like, it's very rare to get the two of them on a really call is. or in a, this first time in a workshop, I've been trying for over a year. Um, so it's great to actually get them here. So if you have any questions of them, um, please uh, put them into the chat. Um, it's, it's just incredible the the, the things that I learn every time I talk to them, I always learn some new uh, piece of information that gives me some new insights. And that's what we're trying to give to you is what are the experience of, of, of experts that we can share with you that if you come across something, you'll know that that looks suspicious now. Like if the countries don't match that you're going to look at that a little more closely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't think about that at first, but, but those are the things that you have to like, you have to have seen it or touched it. And that's the whole purpose of these workshops is to give you that real world experience, look at real data, it's not made up. Um, and when you look at those investigations, you're built, you're training your brain and your eyes to see those patterns that when you come across that again, you're more likely to say, oh, okay, this is the one I'm gonna go down and investigate because of this mismatch. Yeah. Hey Benjamin, we have a, a few questions in the chat. Sure, go uh, ahead. One of them uh, from Mohammed. The information achievement through research and other methods is costly at different levels and upon application practicality 
<clears throat> is it just a small piece of a big puzzle? How can this information be made more valuable? You mean the, the, the threat intelligence that we're giving out, this type of information? Um, so we, we, we have the ability within our solution to actually go through and look at some of this infrastructure. So um, we have a threat intelligence um, module. And if you, if you subscribe to that, you're able then to have all this data, all these indicators as it gets updated, as this stuff goes in, you have all that information, uh, even um, related infrastructure. So things that might be running in an environment that might be okay, but there might be some bad stuff in there. So you'll be able to see that commingling. So those are the types of things that um, are available that we're trying to put together to, to scale it, that you can, you can now take this information and use it internally within your organizations. Yeah, my answer would be that, that you know, there's often three, three different levels of value for intelligence, depending on what it is and what form it is presented in. Um, you'll recall at the top, at the top of this, I, I um, you know, put this caveat out here that we're, we, you know, this was a self-generated um, intelligence requirement that we were meeting. You know, we weren't asked, but in you know, in in other cases, we you know, if we were um, inside an organization, perhaps like you are, you might be asked. Um, specifically to get some information about a particular threat actor or a particular campaign and find out whether or not it's relevant to you. Um, so, you know, it has value in being able to answer questions that are put to you. In other cases, you know, um, I think I, I, I lit upon this uh, on this earlier as well. You know, there, there tends to be three ways in which threat intelligence is applied tactically, Right, so blocking stuff in real time or going back through your network logs to determine if you've been compromised, um, right? Because you, you can't block or detect something you don't know exists. Uh, and so the threat intelligence uh, illuminates stuff that you may, may, maybe did not see or were not aware of, that's one. Operational intelligence, which in this context could help you to identify and preemptively block servers that match the pattern that maybe you don't right. see in your environment but which are configured to deliver this kind of malware or ransomware, whatever it is. And the third one is the strategic intelligence value, which yeah. is to help you understand, if you, if you better understand this adversary and who and, and where what it's targeting and what sort of organizations it traditionally goes after, you can determine whether or not you are in that risk profile and therefore make better judgments about how to deploy your limited resources and security personnel uh, um, appropriately. So you know where to spend the time and where to invest the people um, and where to invest the technology when you're buying things um, so that you can meet that particular need. So I don't know how you put a price on that, but that's in general what is seen as the value in the application of threat intelligence. Right. Yeah. Great, great summing it up. But the, the big thing is um, we're trying to do this to make it easier for you. That's the whole purpose is we're trying to put this in a way that it's easy to consume because the internet's so vast and large. Um, it's very hard to do this on your own. You're not doing 2 billion web requests a day to figure this out or to map it out. You can't, can't you can't do it. So um, we're trying to make it that it's in a way that's consumable and repeatable and scalable uh, to give you that intelligence. So um, Michael, were there any other questions that came in? Well, a lot of them were, co were more comments. Um, okay. what, there's another one there that can you inject these into a modern firewall or into a source solution? Yeah, you can you can export these these um, um, domains and IPs and and things into your your firewalls and and different uh, tips and sores to be able to correlate or alert on. Um, definitely, that's why we're doing this. Um, and within that, um, the threat intelligence. It gives you the capability that um, you could actually just download them. You can download the indicators directly. So yes, easily, and you can script it as well and pull those in. Yep, and I, I can speak from experience there as well. A lot of our customers are are doing that every single day. Uh, they have a API set up uh, to where they're pulling this data into into their tip, into their SOAR, into their SIM, and so on. Okay, 
So if that's if that so we'll move on now to talk about some vulnerabilities, and I can go into the vuln intelligence and, and some articles that recently came out that we can use as a, a, a way of expanding an investigation. So um, you can understand, you know, the capabilities that you can do in Illuminate to help you really understand a threat to see if it's global, if it you have it or a third party has it. Um, so and then we, go ahead. we ran the random generator thing as well. Um, so after this, uh, after we get into some of the vulnerability stuff, we do have the winner of the, the Amazon gift card. So Perfect. We'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll give that up. <laughs> so so um, what I did this week was I went through and I did, I just did a, a search in the search engine and say, show me the, the uh, application vulnerabilities, you know, which, what was new, what was happening. And Fortinet, there was a, um, their 40 web had a uh, uh, web application firewall vulnerability. And um, so I wanted to go and look to see, you know, what it was, what's happening. And um, they weren't going to be patching it right away. They're going to patch it at the end of the month, but there's other vulnerabilities out there. And one thing I've, I've learned from being at Risk IQ is that they can change, they can chain um, vulnerabilities together to get in and do stuff. So they don't have to just go after one, but they can execute one thing that executes something else that executes the, the other piece that's hard to do once they're inside and then they have access and they can do things. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to go through and look at this in, inside of, you know, doing some research, but then also inside of Illuminate to see what I could find and what, what issues would come up. So by looking at this article, it talked about um, which versions were affected, uh, what the vulnerabilities were, what versions you should be running. Um, so I wanted to go through and look at those with inside of Risk IQ. So what I'm gonna do real quick is I have in my, my slide deck, I have all of these listed. So I'm just going to um, bring those up real quick and copy them and paste them so everyone will have them and then we can walk through uh, the investigation together. So give me just a, a reminder, sometimes sometimes when we post it in Slack or not, not in Slack, in the Zoom chat, it doesn't uh, put them all in when we do too many links at once. Yeah, so I'm, I, I hope it will work. Let's see. Okay. And it didn't. So Ow. I still don't know what the magic number is. I don't know either. It's five or what? Okay. Let me let me do five at a time. And you're gonna get a copy of the entire deck with all of these links in here. So you'll have them and we have the recording. So you'll be in great shape. And once again, it didn't like that. So let's go a few more. Okay, and the last group. Okay. So this um, web application firewall basically will filter out traffic. So if somebody's sending in um, some sort of SQL query, for example, it can make sure that someone's not trying to do cross-site scripting or something like that. So this gives you the capability of, of, of examining that, that uh, traffic that's coming through and affecting that traffic to either block or filter things out. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and look at it, and then we're gonna look at RISC-IQ's capabilities of giving that information in an easily consumable format, okay? So in this use case, I wanted to look at vulnerabilities. And in this particular case, it's a vulnerability in an appliance. Now this vulnerability was announced this week. There were some articles that came out talking about Fortinet and their uh, 40 web, which is a web application firewall, um, and that they weren't going to be patching the vulnerability until the end of the month. Now, what's the problem with that is that when a series of vulnerabilities out there, it's not that someone's going to attack just that one vulnerability. They might change several vulnerabilities together to get to the ability 
to execute that one vulnerability. So it might be difficult to execute, but if they can chain a couple attacks together, they might be able to get in and do that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to see what I can find out. So if I came in here, there was a uh, CVE. So I'm just going to copy the CVE real quick. Um, so I have it cached so we can use it in a minute. Uh, and if we open this up into another tab, you can see that um, it talks about the vulnerabilities, all the different CVEs, uh, denial of service, uh, remote access, uh, SQL injection capabilities inside of here. Now, uh, what we can do is if we went into Risk IQ, um, I could just search for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in and I'm going to paste that in. And we're going to see what happens when we search for this. Now, immediately we see some preliminary information about this CVE. We see the affected component, so it's a 40 net uh, 40 web. Um, I can look to see uh, some information about the deep dark web. And I can also see the article that, that mentioned this um, 40 web. And this was seven months ago. So that was that second um, 40 net article that we saw. Now, if I dive into this, the cool thing about um, Risk IQ is now the Vuln Intelligence module that's part of Illuminate. So if we get into it, um, immediately I see the information about the vulnerability, the CVE. Um, I get some um, information like a, a, a priority score by Risk IQ that we say, hey, it's it's critical, you need to take care of it. But we also give you the CVSS2 and 3 scores to show those capabilities and also the CWE. And down below are all of the dark web pieces that are associated with it. Now you can notice that there's an Amai attack surface and third party attack uh, surfaces that are listed here. So if I if I had it, I would now have a number in here. If I clicked on it, I would see where that 40 uh, web was in my uh, attack surface or any third party. So right now there are not any associated uh, with this CVE in my attack surface or any of the third party attack surfaces that we currently have associated with this organization. But the nice thing about this is this is a single place where I can get all the information. I can right click and open on this and get the information directly from Fortinet about this vulnerability. <coughs> or I can come in here and I can click on the, um, the, the CWEs. So now I can clip on, click on that and see that information. Okay. And I can understand it's about not handling SQL injection, uh, improper uh, uh, neutralization of special elements in the data query logic. Um, so I get some good reference information all in one place. And if I go back, if there was a uh, exploit that was out in the wild right now, we would also have that listed. Um, so now I can take a look and see everywhere it's been referenced where that CVE has been mentioned. So if there's any chatter about, hey, do you have this uh, proof of concept or do you have this exploit, we would see that inside there. Now, the other aspect that we can do is we can search for the component to see how far and wide this is. So what I did here was I searched for 40 web. So when I look for that, there are a couple different uh, areas to focus on. So it shows two different hosts. So there's two um, named hosts in here and there's 13,000 um, um, different uh, 40 webs. So what, what I like to do is I like to right click and open another tab to preserve all of my uh, investigation. So think of it like a tree and you're at the trunk. You can go down a branch, but when you get to the very end, it ends. And you might need to go back to the trunk and go down a different branch. So by using uh, the method of opening up new tabs, I can take all of my tabs and save them into a folder and preserve that investigation. So if I'm working on this and I'm not done, I can do that. I can open them up again and it will rerun all those queries and I can see all that, that new data as well. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go out and I'm going to right click and open another tab to see all the 40 web pieces. So when I run this, because it's looking for 40 net 40 web, it's only going to find those and that's what's listed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this a little bit and I'm just going to look for 40 web and I'm going to define it as a component search. And give me a second. As soon as I made that change, it re cached it from, it took from the cache. So now I'm running this one, just looking for 40 web and 
I'm going to expand this to be uh, 500 at a time to view. So this is going to now give me a complete view of all of those assets that are out there based upon IP addresses. Now, if we take a look in here, you'll see that some are 40 web and some are the 40 web dash 220, 2.2.0. So if we can't determine what the version number is, we can still identify the device. So we, we have that. So what I did here was I selected uh, one of the devices. So let's take a look at uh, one of the devices. So I looked at um, this one, 217-64-98-114. And so if we come back here, um, if we look for 114, uh, it's this one, uh, 114, this one. Um, no, it's not. Hold on. Let me grab that one so we can just find it right away. So you can see where it was in the list. So if I search for it, there it is. Okay. So on this one, when you drill into it, and this one I'm just going to click on now, so we can just click on it. Um, immediately I can see all of the domain names that register that uh, resolve to it. Um, but I can look at the services because I clicked on the IP address. And what's nice about this is it shows you the banner information. So I can take a look and see the um, the port 80 banner that was coming out of IIS uh, and what's listed there, uh, but also the 443, and this is where we saw the 40 web uh, information. And if you take a look over here, what we found out was this is using the generic certificate that was with the device when it was purchased. So the organization didn't go in and create their own certificate and add to it. They're using the generic one that came out of the box, which could be the same for a lot of organizations. So if I wanted to see how many people are using the, the generic one that came from Fortinet, um, I can search for a common name or the organization. So this one, I'm going to let's look at the uh, the common name. So if I right click on this one and open another tab, um, we're going to see a lot of hits on this. So it's a good idea to replace the generic certificates that come from the organ from the manufacturer because if you need to um, take away access or do something, if it's your own certificates, it's a lot easier to do uh, than rely upon these other um, the the generic ones that were came default. And you can look at all the infrastructure here that there's six thousand four hundred fifty. Here's one thousand eight hundred sixteen, um, two thousand nine hundred thirty eight. So quite a bit here. So um, we can look at the certificates and you can see all the different ones that are listed, um, where they're located. Here's some from Sunnyvale. Uh, here's some that were from Vancouver and these are from Vancouver as well. So you can see how, how this works. So it's a good idea to um, go in and, and replace those. So um, the global view of this, so if we went and looked at um, the components again, uh, there's 13,000 that are out there in the wild. Um, but if we click on the host names, um, this will show you the ones that might have a DNS resolution or a host associated with that IP address. And there were two older ones that were associated with it. So back in 2018 um, was the last time that we saw these two. Okay, uh, One was um, uh, 2017 and 2018. So all the other ones are really responding just by IP address. Um, so that's uh, this use case. We're going to look at um, Moodle, which is a learning management system. And we're going to drill into this one. So I, I did a, a search uh, as well, and I found out that there was a, um, uh, a reported vulnerability uh, within Moodle. And this vulnerability was, was pretty, pretty big. Um, so I'll play this video as we're um, going through and looking at this. So there was a um, um, the ability for somebody to um, um, get remote access um, to the system um, by um, going in and um, executing some some code. And this is like a little demo showing that they they actually get access to Moodle. And what what this vulnerability allows people to do is if you if you're running this, um, you could potentially become an admin. And if these are run at universities or at organizations doing certifications, somebody could get access 
to the user information and the content that um, the Moodle has. So if you um, are training um, students, if you're, you're doing any type of um, certification program, somebody could get in and, and grab that data. So it's, it's, it's pretty serious uh, for, for, for educational or, or um, institutions like that. So I wanted to go through and investigate this as well and see if I can determine um, not only you know, where Moodle is, how big it is, but to get to the actual um, version number that wasn't displayed inside of Risk IQ. Okay. So give me a second. I'm going to grab those URLs for you and we'll investigate those. So Moodle is this learning management system, and um, Daily uh, Swig talked about this vulnerability and actually posted a video to that, um, showing that that um, uh, pre authorization um, and the the race uh, exploit that they're they're going in. Now, um, this this um, issue that's here um, is pretty serious um, for these organizations. So what I did was I wanted to go out and find out how many organizations in the world were running this. So if we go out and we search for Moodle, um, you'll see that there's over 96,000 hosts and over uh, 241 different, 241,000 different IP addresses that were out there. Um, so it's pretty significant. It's used by a lot of organizations. You might also, there's Drupal, there's Moodle, there's a lot of these learning <laughs> management systems. So um, if we go through and we pivot on the on Moodle, um, we want to go through and I wanted to take a look at the details on it because there was no value other than um, um, there's no version number that was associated with this. So if we take a look at one of these and let me make sure I got the, the right one. So uh, it's 61. So it was this um, it's like I'll paste it in here real quick so we can get right there. So inside of here, um, yeah. if we take a look at the cookies, it shows, hey, Moodle's running. If we look at the components, okay, it gives you the CMS. It tells you it's running on Ubuntu. Um, some of this information, it's running within WordPress as well. So there's a few different things. And if we look at the services, um, it's it has Apache running. So it's an Apache server. And you can even look at the, the certificates that are here. So what I did was I went out to that particular um, place and here is the actual um, domain for it, okay? And this is the actual system. And this is in Portuguese, I think. It's a Portuguese um, site. But if we go through and we view the source. So I went in here and I wanted to find out the exact version. So if you view the source on this one, um, a lot of times you can just type in version. And within the version, um, you can find out there might be a, a date or some information inside of there. So I took this number, um, 2020-06-1502, okay? Now, I found that there's some documentation from Moodle that talks about this. So if I did a search and I did 2020-06-1502, immediately I get the right version number. So it's a way for you, even though that, um, Risk IQ might not have that version number in there all the time, that as an investigator, you might need to go look at yourself or a third party to make sure that you know what version is there uh, without having to really interrogate and do a, a real scan of that. Um, you can use the tools that are available to you, in this case, viewing the source that's already been downloaded to your system um, to be able to identify that particular version. Any questions with, with what we've seen so far? Okay. Um, I'll go into the last piece. Okay. Okay, so here we are at the um, What If I Gym. Okay, so this is uh, an application. So what's kind of funny was I have a friend that's in the CrossFit and um, they go to gyms and they, they can check in and they can look at the, how they're doing compared to everybody else. 
And this is a, a it's a nice um, way of understanding who's at the gym and what their status is, like what they're doing and, and, and track over time how, you're, how well you're doing. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? So <laughs> all that personal information that you have there, um, it gets to the point where um, it could, that could be exposed. So even though that this might not be um, a widely used system, um, it might impact you because at your local gym, it might be there. And um, this is why I investigated this one. So I saw this article that says, hey, hackers are uh, able to get into here. And so what, what the article talks about is that you can change your privilege on the account and become an admin. And once you're an admin, you can start seeing other people's things. You can potentially get into uh, PII. You could get into you know, um, credit card data, different things that might be stored in the system. So um, I went through. And I look for this uh, Woodify in our system. I didn't know if we were going to have it or not. And sure enough, I started to see these components plug, uh, come in from a WordPress plugin. And I went, oh, that's pretty cool. There's, there's 137 of them. So I went through and right-clicked and opened this up inside of RiskIQ to now look at this view. It's not huge. It's a very small, unique set. Um, and I looked at the different... Um, uh, domains that were in here. And I saw this one, boomboxnorth.com. And I went, okay, let's take a look at that. So um, if you if you view this one, it's actually a um, it's actually a gym um, here in, in California, in, in San Diego County. I didn't know at the time, but I ran this. And there's this nice little thing that talks about what Woodify does. And it's just basically what I explained, what you're capable of doing. And so I wanted to go through and do a little deeper in, in investigation into this and to see, well, if it's this WordPress plugin is, you know, what, what else could I find out? So when you look at the site, you can view the source. And inside of here, I can find um, Woodify. And this is where it is. So it's, it's, here's the plugin. Uh, it's it's um, version 307. So I, I have this information now. So now I understand, okay, here's what, what it is. And I have some additional details. So this now gives me the capability of if there's a, a patch or something there, I can make sure my gym actually has that patch installed if this mm -hmm. was my gym. So it can, it can help you in, in that regard as well uh, in your life. So I, I wanted you to see that. Now, I don't know what's happening with the... Um, the CVE piece. So let me see what is, um, if I can run this query and get this up. So I don't know if, uh, Josh, if something happened, but uh, the vulnerability intelligence wasn't responding um, to get that information in here. So yeah. I will show you in a slide what I was going to show you. And um, I will find out um, what happened. So inside of the Vuln intelligence uh, component that we have, um, all of the information that on all the different CVEs are listed in our system. We have over 20,000 from just this year. Um, and each one of those CVEs is mapped to um, the CVSS2 and three and um, any um, known exploit that's out is linked as well. If it if we have if there's it's been um, published, but also the chatter that's happening in the deep and dark web. So we will give you a score um, that's higher if it is a current exploit that there's a it's in the wild and people are discussing it. For example, in uh, the deep and dark web, but it gives you the ability. So instead of having to go and use um, um, a search engine to go through and figure out, okay, let me find out all the research. Let me find out what the weakness is, let me find out how to patch it. It's all in one place. And through our interface, if you just put in a CVE number, it will show you all that information and be able to look to see if that issue is related in your infrastructure or any of the other third parties that you're relying upon. So it's that filter to say, now that I know how you look like, I can tell you everything that, that could be a problem with you, um, but also give you the capability of taking that same view of yourself and applying it to third parties that you're monitoring to say, oh, I don't have the problem, but this third party vendor that I reply, uh, rely upon has it. 
So therefore I need to go and, and talk to them to make sure they fix it. So it's all in one interface. So generally you can go in and with um, Illuminate, you can do a search, you can find all this information and you're able then to um, easily navigate and find all relevant information in a single source. Yeah. So Josh, do you have the name of the person that, that uh, has yeah, won for today? I'm looking at it right now. I think I think we may just have like a uh, an access privilege or something with the lab that's not bringing up the. I think that's what it looks like because I'm bringing it up on our our own you know, internal. Anyway, um, yes, we do have a winner for the uh, for the super duper uh, Amazon gift card today, and that person is Michaela W. Cool. Michaela W. Um, I think there's only one Michaela W here. Um, so that should mean that I, I don't think we have multiple Michaela W's. And it's um, that way, you know, we don't share last names and things like that, everyone. Um, but uh, Michaela, Michaela says, thank you. Oh, there, <laughs> there. Okay. So we do have the correct Michaela. Thanks for being um, here today and a part of the community. Uh, and yeah. Tell your friends, tell everybody, uh, this is what we do every other, every other Thursday. We, we get in, we look at a topic of research, or we look at a particular uh, trend that's going on, or a, a skill set that we want to cultivate and to grow more. Again, you get your credleys uh, for right. being here, your credly badges. So I haven't looked at the pretty artwork for this one, uh, Benjamin. Maybe, it, maybe it'll say that credly, like, APT 29 Slayer or something. Yeah, I'll say something, yeah. But the, <laughs> oh the, the, the CPE credits um, what we're doing is we've, we've partnered with Credly. So we send you out an email and when you register with Credly, it gives you the capability of keeping track of all of them because a lot of you have come to several workshops and you mm -hmm. get two CPE credits for each one. We didn't want you to lose track of those things. So inside of Credly, you can actually print out your certificate, but you can also publish it like on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and people can verify that you actually attended. So there's a way for them to say, yes, you earn this certificate, you earn these credits. Uh, and then if you need to print out a certificate for your own um, file, you can. So when you view it, you can, you can actually print it and it prints an actual certificate. That's right. So um, again, the winner was that, the other thing too, just in terms of like, you know, tell your friends, not only do you get CPEs, not only can you like showcase it, everything with your badge from Credly, but you can, you can keep the fun going and you can invite your, your teams as well to do the trial. So what we did today was we were working with that Illuminate system and you can go to risk IQ, learn more slash Illuminate yeah, in the community.riskiq.com, learn more, Illuminate. If you click on that trial, the, the orange oval there, that's what you're going to want to click on uh, because we're about to burn down the lab when we're done here. And so the lab environment will cease to have access for today. Um, again, come to a future workshop, get access to the lab once again, but you can keep the fun going with your own attack surface, your own vulnerabilities, your own stuff um, with the trial. And so now you've gotten a chance to kind of see how the system works, how we hunt around and find things, how we relate it to ourselves uh, and how we can look at again, vulnerabilities before they become exploits ourselves. So um, would encourage you to do that. And again, it's, it's a 30 day trial of it. It's just intelligence. It's just the capability of looking at those things. So, and after 30 days, hey, you know, I got my use out of it. No harm, no foul. Uh, thanks again for being a part of the community. Thanks for giving it a try. And we're, we're happy to, to be of service to you in any way we can. Only have a couple of minutes left here. Any parting comments, Benjamin, before we well, let the folks- I, I wanna thank John and, and Kevin and, and um, Michael for, for joining us today and helping out because they, it's very right. rare that we, we get such access to them to be able to like learn their mindset, what they're doing, you know, like how they did this because you just read the report, but you don't know what went into making the sausage. Yeah. And this is like the coolest part is to, to have you guys talk about what you're doing every day because it is making a difference in the world. And I want to thank both of you for, for, for doing that. That's right. Yeah, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Sure. Absolutely. For everyone, thank you again for joining our Cyber Threat Workshop, and we'll see you next time. Go get bad guys. Go unmask and defeat adversaries.
Bye-bye, everyone.